Thank you so much for coming today, everybody. We are really excited to celebrate National Poetry Month with today's program, as well as with another poetry focused program that we're having on Saturday, April 22nd at 1 30 p.m. So be sure to look for more information on that. We also have a great lineup of spring and summer programming for all ages. So if you're interested, take a look at those offerings on our website, or you can ask one of our staff members. If you're joining us online, please be sure, if you don't mind, to mute yourself while Ben is reading his awesome poem. And if you are here with us in person, we ask you to silence your cell phones. So we are excited to host poet, writer, and educator Ben Begholt. Since graduating from the Stone Coast MFA program at the University of Southern Maine in 2021, Ben has had a number of poems published in literary journals and anthologies. When he's not planning lessons or scribbling his next poem, he can be found exploring Mount Desert Island on foot and in his 17-foot kayak, or taking on poorly planned home improvement projects. <laughs> that was his quote. <laughs> he currently resides in Otter Creek with his wife and daughter. Ben will be reading poems that can be found in various and who are online tonight with us, Lauren and Lucy. Ben will be reading poems that can be found in various literary publications, as well as from his unpublished poetry manuscript, Almanac, Love Poems from the Unrepeatable World, which he wrote in the aftermath of his father's sudden death while preparing for the birth of his daughter. As a nature lover and a self-described existential optimist, Ben wrestles with the prof profundity of life against the odds. Please help me in welcoming Ben as he reads a selection of his poems that deal in equal parts of loss and celebration, grief and joy, set against the backdrop of a beautiful world teetering on the brink of disaster. Let's hear it for Ben. Thank you all for coming and thank you for those of you who are here and online <laughs> with us. Um, I am so grateful to have uh, three toddlers in the audience. Um, <laughs> you. And so if we could just take a second to acknowledge how awesome that is. Um, so I'll, I'll just start off by reading a couple poems and then I'll, we can keep it pretty loose and, and fun. We'll just hear poems and talk about them. And um, if you have any questions as they come up, you can raise your hand or whatever and, or interrupt me and we'll, we'll just go from there. All right, I spent most of this morning um, or this afternoon splitting wood in my backyard um, as a way to prepare for this. So I'll read a poem about splitting wood. It's called Promethean. If I had known beforehand, I would have stolen it long ago. Had I foreseen the brawny joy of separating grain from grain, the splintering of pith, heartwood and bark, and the queen's sharp scent of pine, charred hands sticking to the mall handle, and the irregular staccato of breath, of impact, steel on stump, the thud of split wood in the wheelbarrow, a hollow bell, a body following gravity's call, and the careful construction of the wood pile, ends crosshashed, columns supporting the loose green logs in between a wall built to be taken down piece by piece and burn. All right. And here's a Valentine's Day Before a War, written on uh, February 13th um, of last year. Men and women cradle wooden rifles as they stalk silent factory floors, snow piling, windows broken like gun smoke. On the border, some evil lurks, awaiting the word of a man whose father beat him, a man whose mother never said, I love you, or you make me proud. Our little home is thousands of miles removed. The stove is warm, the dog poised at your feet. Our daughter fills the winter morning. This is the victory that we fight for, my love, again and again. This small resurgence of sun breaking through, like this bowl of sweet potatoes dug from the garden last fall. They have begun to sprout, little eyes erupting into pale pink shoots, tiny purple leaves unfurling in the light. 
So uh, I teach a class um, at community uh, adult community education. Um, and we were talking about chiaroscuro, the the term that talks about the balance of light and dark as a painting term, but it also applies beautifully in in writing. And so um, I think as Mainers, we're very sensitive to light and to the absence of it. Um, and so I think as we, there's sort of a, there's a sense of humor that goes along with the darkness, right? So I just, that's sort of what I always try to keep in the back of my mind, no matter how, um, how tough something gets. So this is a poem called Resistance. Each day I try to practice one small act of resistance, one small refusal to accept the inevitability of certain things, like tightening the laces of my running shoes or loading the dishwasher. Entropy and decay may be a natural state of things, but maybe they are not quite. Perhaps each of us in our own way must move through this maze like carpenter ants, chewing tunnels through the wood pump, the way we must wind through tangled neighborhoods, feet pounding, asphalt lullabies, hearts beating against the architecture of the chest, pausing only for a moment to catch our breath because any moment a tree may blossom. So after my, my dad died, I, I started running just sort of this like, you know, I was like, oh, I better get in shape, but also um, as a way to kind of process how how things were going. And I just need to be outside, I need to be alone, I need to um, move my body. Um, my dad died of a heart attack uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago. And, um, After uh, after Lucy was born, we uh, we went down and stayed with my grandmother, and uh, Lucy stayed in in my dad's room and uh, in her little pack and play, and she slept beautifully. It was one of the first nights, and she slept really well. Um, and I just I found that to be really beautiful. But it was also complicated going and looking at his belongings. And so here's a poem called My Father's Heart. I find three watches in my dead father's room. Three watches in my father's room, dead. My father's dead watches, there are three. In my father's dead room, I find three watches. Dead room, three watches, I find my father. I find my father dead, three watches. Three rooms I find in my dead father's watches. Find my watches, father, three dead rooms. I, the oldest son, find that I cannot stand three sons my father had, watches, analog, black strap, brown strap, no strap, in, as in frozen in time, my non exclusive possessive, dead, formerly living, re recently expired, father's possessive. This was his, I was his son. Room, his chamber, like the chamber of a heart. When there is a quiet moment, I slip upstairs. As a child, I would find old photos of my grandparents and their three and four children. Now a portrait watches as I move through the hallway in silence, treading the wood and carpet with my bare feet, the wooden door ajar, dead ahead. I am standing where my father's body came to rest, just outside his room. This is called Dayenu. It's a Hebrew term um, that uh, an old mentor, when I was teaching at another school, uh, explained to me as um, meaning enough, uh, as in 
if God had only done so much, it would have been enough. It's sort of the idea. But I kind of bastardized it. You call me after the cremation. You call me after so many years. You call me. And I say, it was enough. Misquoting an old mentor, quoting the Haggadah. But we are not Jews. And what do we know of God or Jesus for that matter? Or even the waking sleep from which we work so hard to wake, you call me. With your thumb in the worn pages of Joshua Slocum's book, that lonesome anachronism wandering the seas our father loved so much, and you tell me about your trip to the bookstore, your search for an atlas as if you could find his soul somewhere on those oversized pages, or in the wide expanses of blue, perhaps adrift on the Atlantic or cast away on some tall, you could trace the lines of latitude arrest the compass rose, dredge shallow harbors and plunge to the deepest depths, as if those years carried a cargo precious battened away in a cedar-lined hull. It helps me to think of him as a man at the helm of his ship at sea, humming a siren song. As I said, my father was complicated. And uh, so there were times in childhood where um, you had to get your story kind of straight. Um, and it was a complicated situation, but so this, is a, uh, this is a poem about that. When I came back from Greece the summer I was 10, I had new skin on my calves where the old skin had burned in the Aegean sunlight while snorkeling with Michael and his older sister. And I had grown another inch or two in the things I had seen, like Michael's grandpa emerging from the surf with an octopus, a heptademicus he pun, for it had seven and a half legs. The creature clung to his hand, slow and insistent, Put me back, it seemed to say to the old Greek, who charged us with the task of tenderizing the octo hepta demi puss on the hotel steps. I stood aside and watched pale arm Michael lift and hurl with life ebbing, with ink sack breaking and writhing survivors' supple limbs slackening against the beachfront stairs until. Michael and his grandpa presented the tentacled mass of flesh to the kitchen for dinner that night. When I came back from Greece the summer I was 10, my mother told me not to tell my father where I'd been. When he came to visit, I did as I was told and lied. This is a poem called The House. Some days I can walk through the old house and see every detail of everything. The fireplace with porcelain tiles and the brick, the ash below the grate, my father's boots beside the hearth, the laundry chute in the corner of the dining room, a tapestry hanging over the piano, my father playing Jocelyn, a window seat and wooden dining table made of oak. Beyond there's the kitchen where my mother stands preparing dinner and the one small bathroom and the back door. Outside, I see three kids playing in the yard. The light is very bright and the boundaries of the shadows are sharp. Today, I think I took a wrong turn, ended up in the basement somewhere with the lights off and the door shut. The smell of mildew and sawdust and an old wall-to-wall -wall carpeting is all very close right now. There is a low electric hum, low dripping of water in the utility sink. This one is called Foraging. 
She says, when I ask what she remembers of the early days is how he saw the color green, the way that leaves contained a thousand hues, the difference between one and another. She hadn't known until they met the order of the solar system and how the earth spun round the sun. I knew they hadn't spoken in years and when I told her he was gone, I don't know what I expected in her voice. My father lived by the almanac in the Book of Ties, he knew the movement of planets, the names of constellations, and more. More than once when I was a child, we watched the shadow of the Earth spread across the full moon surface, a gradual dimming to an absence of light, like it was gone. And sometimes as a child, I'd watch a different shadow cover my father's face, and I'd watch and wait for the light to return. And once just off a trail, we found a sprawling colony of sulfur ledge mushrooms springing from the pregnant bark of a wind downed oak. Our busy hands made short work of the fleshy, golden, fruiting bodies. We broke off great chunks and wrapped them in bandanas and sweatshirts, filled our backpacks and satchels. And I remember the cool, damp scent of decay mixing with the promise of a feast. In the way my father always could spot a mushroom growing, even in his later years with his eyesight going, he could find their speckled crowns emerging from the forest floor. He brushed pine needles from their soft caps and humus from the stems each fall. He returned to the same stump of a tree he felled years before and gathered his hen of the woods. The one that grew as big as a real chicken, like feathery butterflies braided together. Silent silver dancer, each autumn, my father brought one back from the woods. And we separate the strands of grief, the aftermath of some great falling in the forest, and fry it up with butter and wine and salt and pepper and toast our good fortune, our communion with the woods. So that's the first part. I'm just reading you through my manuscript, by the way. <laughs> um, you can also check the time to make sure I'm not. Okay, good. So we, we've been going at this for 20 minutes. How's everybody doing here? How are you feeling? Okay. Not giving you too much heavy stuff. People online, you good? Good. Okay. You can hear me all right. All right. Okay. Uh, so here we go. This is part two. Razor. After Ockham's razor. Mm -hmm. The principle was this, to cut away the useless, to cast it off, to render the fat and cleave the meat from bone, the quick from the dead. Perhaps, though, truth is not as simple as a butcher's job. Maybe we cannot take the mystery and hang it from the rafters and bleed it dry, drawn and quartered. Perhaps some things are less, are best left undisturbed. Maybe if we can simply pay attention to the whole thing and the things contained within, we could end one endlessness and begin another. For not only do things fall apart, but they also coalesce. And there are more ways of making two than cutting a thing in half. I don't know if it was really a refute to Ockham, but it's a riff, it's a riff on Ockham's razor. This is a sonogram, 12 weeks, five days. In the first of the series of pictures, the numbers and letters superimposed tell me that your heart at that moment was beating 157 times each minute. In the center of the picture, a dark cavity offset and to the left, I can see a little bright spot. For so long, I was fixated on what was recognizable, the features I, with my human eyes, could decipher, the structures of your perfect arms and tiny legs, the outlines of bones and carpels, the evidence of fingers, the profile of your nose. But here, I can see your heart as it was for a moment at 2.31.04. PM. By now, three weeks later, it has surely grown and changed. Ventricles and chambers must be taking shape, the pulse growing stronger, 
slower as you continue your growth. This may be one of the few times I will see with secrets you will keep locked away in the warm, dark space, safe from the outside world. And that is as it should be. But years later, if anyone should ask me about the contents and quality of your heart after you are born and grown up, I will say to them that long ago, it was the brightest thing I could see on the longest nights of the year. This is a uh, full spring. When we were kids, my brother had a piece of pyrite. He treasured it, kept it in the cubby near his bed. We knew it wasn't gold, but still we bring it out and marvel at the way it glittered in the light. The way the sun reflected off each tiny facet. Ancient people used to strike their blades against it, sparking fires in which they offered up lambs and oxen to the gods. Today, the sun glints off the ice, it flecks the little stream nearby. My wife and I take down our box of seeds and sort them once again. Like prospectors, we dream of greens and gold, of a summer garden even as the temperature drops and the sap retreats while last year's leaves swirl in the wind, yet still we go on counting the days until last frost, striking steel against this fool's spring to see what sparks ignite. Ah. This is this is the, the pregnant part of the manuscript. This is called quickening. Yesterday, for the first time, your mother felt the flutter of your tiny foot against the inside of her belly. And she put my hand there, right below her navel, and said, can you feel it? And I tried, tried, but your kicks are still so faint. And she said, it all feels so real now. Does it feel real for you? My hand caressed your mother's skin. I held my breath. And you ran your tiny hand along the wall of your mother's womb. Okay, this is for the, the bird lovers out there. If anyone knows what a white throated sparrow sounds like, um, I was listening to them for years. And I didn't know what they were until I finally figured it out. And the way I figured it out was reading a poem about a white throated sparrow and the poet described her, the sparrow's call so perfectly that I I knew that's what the what the bird was. So it's a poem about that discovery. It's after the poet Bridget Pajini Kelly. You should look her up. All I had to go on were the notes descending in a minor key. I tried to write a poem. I tried to memorize the melancholic song. When I was a child, I once slept in a room haunted by a whippoorwill and found my peace with his song, Sweet Sad Bird. And now I find you in a poem singing to a statue outside a bedroom window in my garden of flesh and stone. And then uh, for all the gardeners out there uh, who've ever waged war against um, some invasive species. This is called a uh, machine in garden. Because the wild rose choked the makeshift fence, I borrowed a little blue backhoe in the early spring rain when everything was still brown and the grass was uncut green. I cut those sprawling branches, pulled cinder block and wire from the tangle. And because the machine was in the garden, I drove those caterpillar treads across the hundred feet of dirt to level the soil for growing. And the mud brought forth clover and dock and thistle and jewel weed, a meager harvest of winter squash, flowers, and tomatoes. And when the killing frost took the last vines, I mowed and cleared and tilled it all in and scattered compost spread shredded leaves before the upturned clay hardened in the sun. This is called kite. 
Do you know how this kite works? Of course you don't, not yet at least, but I know someday you will know what it is to hold the string, to feel the wind vibrating on the cord, the sunshine blinking tears from your eyes, like you are sending a part of yourself way, way up there with all the other birds, even when your feet are planted firmly on the ground. Yesterday, I saw a dad and his kid at the ball field with a kite and the daylight savings light. And it didn't seem to matter how many times the kite would fall or spin or nosedive to the ground. The kid would run to the gusty wind, kite tail streaming colors flying wild. Oh, child to be, I hope you have it all. The sun, the wind, the thaw, after the winter, Hold my hand and we'll hold this string. We'll run into the wind together. Maybe we'll see a flash of color rising up against the blue. And when it's time to let you go and fly your own kite, I'll stand back here and blink sunshine from my eyes. So that's part two. That's it. That's it to Here's the end of part two. This one is called, This is Not Another Poem. This is not another poem about how poems are made, but rather it's about how quickly the floor can give way. No metaphors are for those among us without the language to describe the moment before and after the surgeon considers the night and then reconsiders as the heartbeat of the body within the body slows almost to a halt and then resumes its variable pace, that little word for us on the monitor, trotting and cantering and galloping toward daylight. All right, so um, when Kate asked me to, to write a little thing about the program, I hyped up this whole thing about existential optimism. Uh, and uh, I didn't realize that the newspaper would run that as a headline, uh, <laughs> which I chuckled at. And then I also said, well, what the hell is an existential optimist? Because I made that term up. Um, and so it's really kind of um, taking, taking a couple of ideas and meshing them together. But I like to tell people the story of Sisyphus, um, the Greek, uh, anti-hero who tried to cheat death and was sentenced to rolling a boulder up the hill for all of eternity and every time you get to the top it would roll back down um albert camus in his great essay the myth of sisyphus um uses sisyphus as a metaphor for life he says life is kind of like that we're rolling the boulder up the hill and it rolls back down forever <laughs> uh, and uh i think and, and he, he kind of goes through a couple of different options as to what you can do when confronted with that fact. But ultimately he says, you can, you can what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my back into it. Because you can imagine Sisyphus smiling at the end of the day, getting ready for his next, taking pleasure in the work, right? Um, so that's my, that's my short and pithy version of, of what I think it means to be an existential optimist. Um, but here's a poem called Sisyphean. We started off with Promethean. Prometheus, the guy who stole fire for the humans. Uh, here we are with uh, Sisyphus, and he's addressing the boulder. <clears throat> I come to you in the darkness of this dreamless night, my friend, your darkened form like the new moon against the starlit sky. I place my hands against familiar holes, Worn smooth by the gods know how many days I've toiled. I have sweated, I have bled with you, dear friend. Forget my aching joints, my leather hands, my blistered heels. Forget the evening when my grasp will slip and you will fall. Come, my dearest friend, the sun now rises in the east, our day's begun. So that's that's my poem about Sisyphus. Drink some water. How's everybody doing? That's good. Right. <laughs> Let you take a second and take a second. All right. 
So this is part three. How often is it that you get someone reading an entire book of poems to you? Oh, that's actually great. <laughs> Thank you for sitting through it. I appreciate it. <laughs> I have a message from Kaylee Hess. Life with the toddlers is devolving rapidly, so we have to go, but this is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. <laughs> Thanks for coming. All right, this is called Shadows. After the halfway house, my father lived briefly in a small apartment in Fall River. I only saw him there once or twice when I was 10 years old. There was not much furniture, maybe a table and some chairs, but there was light from the eastern facing windows and the floors were made of wood. I think we ate Chinese takeout next to the flame of a hurricane lantern. And he showed me how to make an oil lamp out of an old soda can with a jackknife, a piece of cotton string and a little bit of canola oil. We cut the can in half and put inch long slits down the side folding the metal inward on itself like the reverse petals of a strange aluminum flower. Then we gently pinched the top of the cutoff can together as if to make a sort of spout and poured the fuel into the base and fed the string down into the oil. He let me use the lighter, my clumsy thumb sparking the flint, and we turned off the lights and watched the low smoky flame casting shadows on the walls. Who remembers learning to drive stick shift for the first time? <clears throat> this is called driving lessons. I sit in the driver's seat of my father's 1986 Dodge Colt, sky blue with the top of the dirt road with the 13th floor elevators on the tape deck and lead belly cassettes on the floor, stubs of rolled cigarettes and ash, pennies and loose tobacco in the cup holder and the smell of secondhand smoke and sawdust and rag wool, vinyl and old leather. I won't even touch the wheel without first listening to the patient instructions given between flicks of his lighter and clenched teeth. The punch of the worn clutch with the left foot, my sweaty palm working the gears, clutch in, first, clutch out, clutch in, neutral, clutch out, brake. Only after working all the way up to fourth and all the way back down to reverse will he let me turn the key in the ignition while he rolls another cigarette. Only one side ever played from my own car's driver's seat now, for the hundredth time, the deft motion of the delicate balance of paper and shag in his left hand and the shifter in his right, the steering wheel held steady with his knees, will I realize just how damn lucky that we all were to be alive. The engine sputters and catches. My father cops up phlegm, but this won't be what kills him 17 years later. I press the clutch to the floor and shift into gear, feathering the gas, like he says, while depressing the spring-loaded pedal. And then the machine lurches forward, spitting blue smoke and gravel before stalling out. He brushes off the ember that falls on his pant leg tips the ash out the window and takes another long drag. This one's called, I saw my dead father last night and it's not a ghost story, don't worry. I saw my dead father last night in the movie we were watching on the couch. A man, the everyman hero, crashes his car in Northern Greece killing his girlfriend and bumbling into some made-for-TV conspiracy. But that was not the man who reminded me of my father dead these past nine months. Instead, it was the kind villager who found the man asleep in a truck, hiding from his pursuers. It was this man's mannerisms, the body language, his gruff demeanor and scruff, the way he beckoned to the American. Come, he says, you want food the way he tended to the man's wounded arm, the tender pantomime. I saw my dead father in the frame made wiry by years of outdoors work and late middle-aged slouch of a man content to be alone. Tell me, 
Why is it that those we love the most complicatedly are those whose gestures remain and linger long after they are gone? For all the guitarists out here, who hears um, guitar strings. Every so often, when I tune the old guitar, one of you will snap. And I know that I have done it again. I've over tightened or under maintained, and then begins the slow process of unstringing the rest, one by one, unwinding, releasing the music of your taut forms. Now the guitar stands naked. Five old strings tangled quiet on the floor, a memory of sound. Let's see what time is. How are we doing? We got about seven minutes left. I'd love to leave some time for questions if you have any, but if you don't, keep reading. Um, here's, uh, I'll read two more and then we can kind of. See how everyone's doing. Uh, okay. Um, this is good sailing after Henry David Thoreau's last word, which were now comes good sailing. Actually, I think he said Indian moose as his actual last word, but I think his first, uh, his last full sentence was now comes good sailing. I think he was tripping on a fever or something. On a bitter cold night, my breath illuminated by a wolf moon, I cross the snowy surface of your pond. I hope to catch a glimpse of something more than a pile of pilgrim's rocks. I think they said you caught your death while counting tree rings in a rainstorm. Like you, you knew the stream you fished in, the one you called time was dwindling and running dry, your fragile lungs constricting gasping like a fish pulled out on ice, those scaly gills flapping like useless wings, like the pickerel in which you saw the universe reflected in a single glassy eye. I'll maybe catch your solitary spirit, grab it by the woolen coat. Or was that solitude to put on like those old professors smirk? Because I think I know something of loss and sorrow, and I think it had you by the jaw like the hook that fish had taken, or like the lockjaw cut that took your brother's life. I think I knew so, know something of grief and also of the woods. Touched as they are by humankind, they are still listening to the wildness within, I swear. New England men like you and me, your rows of beans, my tidy garden beds. We saunter down the country lanes and stride across the broad spring meadows. Race against engines of combustion beneath a scarlet sky. I place this coin in godly trust on the smooth steel rail. A train approaches, barrels west. I turn my back on faith and church. Embrace the music of the field mouse, the grass stains of transcendence. And then here's uh, one more. We can, we can check in. Hummingbirds. This is part four. I watch hummingbirds, little red throated things, with my daughter of 10 days, and my thoughts cradled in my arms. They zip and zoom from the jewel weed beyond the fence to the catmint in our yard and the snapdragons, and then up into the sprawling boughs of the silver maple, where some other birds, flycatchers perhaps, hop from twig to branch to limb and dive spiraling outward, downward, returning to the silver green canopy, a bug in the beak, a small victory in the dust. My daughter's tiny body softens in the breeze, in the breeze, her new eyes growing wide. And I strain my ears in fading light to hear the rapid flutter of the hummingbird wings and the beating of her heart. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we got we got five minutes, um, three minutes left in the program. Do you have any? If you have any questions, yeah, go ahead. So your poems are so beautifully spare. Does it come to you that way? 
or do you have like a lot, a lot of lines and you're you cut it back? No, I, I think I, I tend to be minimalist. And I, some of the feedback I got from mentors over the course of my, my time in the MFA was to try to lengthen things down. Um, you know, see if I could write past the ending. Um, so that's always a struggle for me. And um, part of why I'm teaching a nonfiction class right now so I can practice uh, writing. <laughs> but, um, being very con condensed is, is definitely the, the way that they usually come out. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, Wayne. Can you speak to, well, first of all, thank you. That was amazing. And I enjoyed it so much. I feel like I know you even better than before. And anyways, Tom, can you speak to the uh, the parts and, and how you chose to orient each and yeah. there's a thought process? Sure, yeah. So um, so this manuscript that I'm, I'm shopping around trying to get, get published um, was sort of a, it came out of the experience of Basically, it, I wrote it over the course of a year, um, starting when my father died and ending when when Lucy was about three or four months old, um, give or take. And there's some some stuff from way before and stuff from a little bit after. But um, so it's organized in four parts that um, somewhat correspond with the season, somewhat chronologically, but also um, lots of flashback. Um, so I try to I try to um, find a balance between sort of the um, and the grief and the joy, the 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 light and the absence of it. So that's sort of how I was thinking about it when I put this together. Cool. Okay, right. we have a question from Mia Dyson. Ben, do you find that your new home slash location in Southwest Harbor has influenced your work? It's funny, Mia. I'm I'm on the I'm on the island. I'm not in Southwest Harbor, but um, I'm, I am on the island, and it's I think it's it's going to influence my work. I would say that um, I haven't written a ton since we moved here because. Of, the logistics of moving and but it's starting to seep its way into my consciousness and I think that's sort of what happens when you stay put in a, a place for a while you um, end up absorbing a lot of the surroundings it's just starting to come out now um yeah thank you Mia I'm really looking forward to um writing into this place yeah wait I happen to know that you've had a recent experience with a wood splitter. And I wonder if that um, changed anything meaning wise for you with that first poem that you wrote. Um, yeah. Yeah. Speak, speak to that. yeah. So um, so the first poem was uh, the Promethean, right? It's sort of imagining this the god who brings down fire, um, splitting wood for, for the first time. And it was based on experience of actually finding some wood on the side of the road and bringing it home and chopping it up for for little campfires um so I, I splitting wood was a huge part of my childhood both by hand and with a log splitter so uh, i i did find that after a day of using the wood splitter i i had to i i went over to the hardware store and picked up a splitting mall and a wedge and um there's there's an unparalleled joy to um Doing it by hand and faster, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I still have the wood splitter in my backyard. My neighbor's been very generous. <laughs> Joking place. So, do you write every day, or do you, uh, you know, have an idea for a poem and hang on to it until something else comes? Like, are you working from? Uh, images or pieces of language. Can you talk a little about your process? Yeah. That's, a, that's a great question. So there are times when I've been very, um, very uh, dedicated to like a daily writing practice. Yeah. At the beginning of the pandemic, I wrote a poem a day for I think 70 days straight. You know, it was like my my journal. Um, and there was nothing else to do. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, but I do find that um, regardless of whether or not I am in a, in a daily writing practice, uh, I'm always hanging on to the image. It's the mm -hmm. image that, that um, is the, the germ that grows every poem. So, um, and while that may, that may end up getting edited out as the poem develops, but every one of those poems, I think, comes from, from a, a sensation um, from the five senses. Are you a writer as well? Do you, what, how do you write your poems? Um, I mean, I, I do morning pages, you know, so I'm journaling in the morning just to kind of be in, in practice. Yeah. And then, I mean, I'm a theater maker, so I'm thinking about the event and how uh, language can work in performance. And I, I thought it was cool that that's also going on tonight. I mean, th this is an interesting experience to, to be able to encounter your poetry like together yeah. in this space and also in your own voice. It's pretty powerful for me. So cool. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you all taking time out of your evening to, to come to this. And thank you for people who are online. I keep looking over here, but I should be looking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm curious this is where I close it out. Then. Okay. No, you yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, Ben. This was Thank fabulous. Um, if you have any other questions, let us know, and uh, we'll be here at the library. Happy Poetry Month.